Um, looking a little sparser than usual. We got 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 18, 20, I guess we're mostly here, more than half of us anyway. Okay, well, um, main thing I wanted to do today is make sure you guys uh, not only understand genetic algorithms, but are comfortable with them at an intuitive level. If we achieve that, then I feel really comfortable with you doing this assignment, and then we can move on to the next topic. So let's start with that. Any questions about last lecture or about genetic algorithms before I jump into it? Yeah. I had a quick question about um, whenever, you, whenever we show our answer in it, if you want us to run the code to pull back a new one each time, like a new ah. evolved thing each time, or do you just want us to copy and paste the Oops, I forgot the internet. Um, yeah, I'd like it to just work for the grader. And the way to do that is just, is after you evolve this big gene that you like, print it to the console, copy it, paste it in your code. Now it's hard coded. And now you can battle your gene versus Bob gene. And it'll just work. So that means the grader's not actually gonna see your evolutionary optimizer and won't really be able to check that you even did it right. But please have your code that runs evolution or simulated evolution in there somewhere so that we could do it if, we, if it came down to it. But ultimately, make it deterministic so that when the grader sees it, you'll know for sure it's going to just work and then there's no issues there. OK. Any other questions? Cool. Uh, out of curiosity, how many of you have started this assignment? It's pretty easy, isn't it? Any major snags? I'm having trouble making the AI less stupid. OK. It gets, it gets progressively less stupid over time, so Four. not in a reasonable amount of time. OK. Um, well, this is probably the first lesson of genetic algorithms, is they're really, really slow. So I don't know that that's necessarily wrong. When you say it gets better, but it takes a long time, do you mean insane amounts of time? Or, um, well, or I mean, normally, as in five minutes, or as in three days? OK, first of all, how long is it supposed to run to take like 50,000 generations? Ah, so well, it depends what you define as a generation. I guess technically a generation implies that every <coughs> member of the population has been advanced through time. Um, I think I actually did 50,000 iterations, which sort of means I did 50,000 times of applying a diversifying operation, a uh, tournament, and a... Yeah, that's why I was counting I, I think I did 50,000 tournaments is what happened. Yeah, that's why. And between each tournament, I did some number of mutations can't remember how I did it, and some number of, and then I replenished however many I killed off. I think I killed off a third of my population each time. Because right before class, my uh, was running at about 70,000 generations, and I still wasn't beating Bob. Ah, OK. What that means is I <clears throat> mutated in a slightly better way than you did, or it just got lucky on mine and but, didn't but on yours. But if I had four in my population, I beat yours within 100 generations. OK. That's not surprising, and that gives you a real easy way to sort of cheat on this assignment. And by sort of cheat, I mean I'm not defining that as cheating. So you may do that, but it does mean that's kind of lame. Yeah, it? that's what I was thinking as well. Yeah, so while admitting this assignment is kind of lame, and I apologize for that, I don't want to change it at this point because plenty of you have already gotten started. OK, yeah. I've had the same thing going like, uh, one of the guys from last week said where just in the random population it already beat Bob. Like, Dang. So now, is it Rotating. possible that there are multiple dominant strategies and it just depends on who you're playing? Yeah, so the, the game is definitely chaotic and I know that because... How do I know that? Well, I thought about it for a long time and I couldn't yeah. think of a strategy that was really easy to code up that would always do it. Um, I guess that doesn't mean it's chaotic, but I don't know. 
the have you, out of curiosity, have you tried visualizing it? Meaning, you, you beat Bob in the tournament. Have you watched watch it play out and see what it does? Yes. How does it beat Bob? Swerves. Bob it swerves just, and Bob just misses. Yes. And mine with okay. Bob Jr. Just, just smacks it super hard. Yeah. Okay. Mine like that and waits, and then and then Bob just runs into the wall after it hitting him. Okay. Well, you know what that that sounds slightly intelligent, doesn't it? So therefore, we have demonstrated that evolution can produce something that's slightly intelligent. <coughs> I'm going to say that's not really awesome, but it's slightly intelligent. So if you just ran it for many, many generations with some kind of harder problem, with some kind of more interesting metric, presumably something interesting would come out of it. Is that a fair argument? Well, I think it's a valid argument anyway. Um, that does mean this assignment isn't really testing your evolutionary optimization to its limits, but it is testing it. So. I'm going to call that good. Sorry for the lameness of this assignment. OK. Yeah. Yeah, real quickly. So as we do mutations uh, for the next Gaussian, uh, what do we know what like limits we should set from the onset, like from what possible values we should, the range of possible values that we should toggle each week by? Or is that in and of itself one of those metaparameters that like, uh, it's gonna get involved. That's a good ah, you're saying what are the max and min values that a weight should ever be? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's a better way to put it. Okay. I do want to talk to you a little bit about how neural networks work, and I think that intuition is necessary to really tell what the weight should be. Um, in theory, it should go from negative infinity to infinity. In practice, probably about negative 30 to positive 30 is the extreme limits of it. If you were to clip them at about negative 30 and 30, then no ill effects would happen. That wouldn't stop your neural network from representing anything you wanted. Um, there's the quick answer. I'll give you a better answer as we talk about it. OK? All right. Um, actually, before we even get into it, let's look at this. So somebody sent me an email. Have you seen this before? Somebody made a JavaScript-based website that's doing evolutionary optimization inside of a physics engine. And it randomly generates these, well, pseudo-randomly generates these uh, box car designs for a car that's supposed to drive. Now, obviously, these designs are mostly stupid <laughs> because it uses triangles and wheels. <laughs> but eventually, it starts to find one that works. And the more it evolves, the more it starts to uh, <laughs> get moving. So now, the next generation, once it starts over again, it'll use more of that one that got really far, because that's how it measures fitness. And we'll see that eventually it learns to build intelligent boxcar designs. Plus, it's just darn amusing, so we can sit and watch it for a little while, right? Hey, got a pretty good one now. It made it to the red line. So now we have to watch it for a whole generation. It's, uh, let's see, somewhere I set the population size. I don't remember where that is. Okay, my population size is 20. And you see it's working through all 20 of them. As soon as it gets down to 20 tries, then it'll reset, and the new population will be emphasized more like the ones that were successful. Hey, there you go. I think this one's gonna make it. Oh, it got stuck. It weighed too much. Okay, now it's on the next generation, and you'll... I think it's going to be a little bit more intelligent this generation because it had the experience of the previous generation. There were obviously still some bad designs in the population, so it's going to do some dumb things. But hey, it came back. And the one with no wheels, obviously stupid design. 
Okay. <laughs> but this is just fun with, a, fun with genetic algorithms. Um, down here, everybody posts their, uh, the links for versions that they think are really cool. So let's try one of those. We'll just seed it. What's that one? Input seed car. There's a pretty darn good car that evolved. You have to wonder how long somebody sat and watched this thing before that car emerged, right? <laughs> you know somebody has wasted hours upon hours of time. Okay. And lots of dumb ones. So let me show you one that I did. I'll let that play while I'm getting it open. Okay, I'm building my code for just a minute. Hey, it made it. I should have built this before class, I apologize. Actually, while that's building, let me show you another one. Um, all cooperation. Now let's see. This one's interesting. Oh, don't tell me they took it down. Oh, good. Okay, so they took a bunch of, uh, they took a physics engine and uh, applied evolutionary optimization to it. This is after many, many generations of evolutionary optimization. The way they measure fitness in this case is they see how far the thing walks before it falls over. And they built these robots with various sizes. What's really interesting is as you change the shape of the body and then evolve to walk with it, it, it adapts in ways that look kind of like how people adapt to funny body shapes, which is really funny. Um, but the thing I find fascinating about this is, don't they just look biologically plausible? The, the reason that's cool is, well, hey, that, that implies that that's kind of what's going on, is biology's <laughs> developing the, these gates through similar uh, mechanisms. Okay, so here they show after six generations, they didn't do so well. After 17 generations, they learned so well. <laughs> Took 900 generations to really learn how to walk. <laughs> There's something about a physics simulator that we really uh, relate to, isn't there? I mean, we understand working in a physical environment. <laughs> That poor uh, <laughs> robot. <laughs> okay, so here they're trying to force it to run at different speeds. <laughs> I like the slow mo here. <laughs> I guess we've <laughs> reinvented the notions of gait and canter and uh, gallop. Apparently kangaroos are effective. Doesn't that almost look like a real thing in slow-mo? Okay, so here, here the fitness function is can you stay up, right? And they attack it a bunch of different ways until it learns to support it. <laughs> At some point, violence against robots is almost not funny anymore once it starts looking too plausible, right? <laughs> okay, this one, this one's great. So, I 
guess it's learned how to turn. Or being mean to the big robot again. It's interesting how it's learned to kick just to get those big. <laughs> <laughs> It's learned to kick while it walks to keep those blocks off its path when it's going. Oh, this is cool. So here's different gravities. Um, astronauts apparently walk like that on the moon, which is rather telling. I get what the difference is here. Oh, okay. Oh, so if you, so in the normal one, it, it took into account uh, energy expent in addition to whether it survived, and so it tried to minimize something more plausible. <laughs> 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 There's a zombie. But yeah, if you don't put in the fitness function some metric of how much energy it's expending, it'll it'll learn to expend crazy amounts of energy, whereas humans wouldn't do that. Okay. Um, unfortunately, the one I made isn't that cool, but just to show you that we can code it up too. Okay, here's mine. Jumper train. So I, I took a physics engine and in the physics engine I built an artificial robot and I used evolutionary or genetic algorithm to try and train the thing to jump. And I measured fitness by how high it got. Um, by height I mean I found all the parts of this robot's body and I took the lowest part and I called that the height. Does that make sense? So it's training right now. And if I do jumper policy zero, so here's what I gave it to start with. You didn't see it because it was in the wrong screen. <laughs> but I, I started by giving it something that almost sort of jumps, but not quite, just because that helps it seed the evolution. It takes thousands of generations before it figures out to jump on its own. And so by giving it this, I gave it a better starting point. Okay, now we're up to several. Let's try after a thousand generations. Oops, jumper policy 1000. Oops, here it is. It got a little bit higher, not a lot. But if you look closely, you'll see it learned to finally lift up its feet because that gives it more height. Okay, let's see what we're getting to. Now we're at 3000, we'll try that one. Hate how it opens in that window. Now it's starting to look a bit retarded, but the thing is, is it gets a little bit higher. If you measure it empirically, this is a little bit higher than before. In track and field, don't they have one of their jumps where they jump sideways over a bar? They might, and maybe it's actually found that. I don't know. It's the high jump, you don't go straight over. The other thing is, I just put this robot together based on a ragdoll demo that they had. I applied my own impulse forces to the joints. I have absolutely no reason to believe this is biologically plausible. It's not like a human body, and the weight isn't distributed like they are in humans, and I did nothing to try and minimize energy use, whereas humans don't like burning using muscles they don't have to so there's all kinds of reasons why this isn't true to life um, anyway here's the height it got to so it used to get to 0.5 after a bunch of evolution got higher then notice it actually drops 
So it's getting worse for a moment, and then it got better again. Why do you think that happens? It's exploring, but also one thing I don't. One thing I do in this genetic algorithm is I don't keep the best member of the population around for sure. Um, every member of the population has a chance of dying, and at this moment, it looks like the best member of the population actually got killed off in a tournament, and now the best one's pretty bad. And yet, it didn't take too long before it bounced back and a better one evolved. Does that make sense? Um, why would I do that? Or would your genetic algorithms be better if you kept the best member of the population around? What do you think? Not necessarily. Why? Because you may be finding a local um, best instead of a global best, like that terrain map you were talking about. Yeah, exactly. Okay, let's look at this one. It's got up to 83, 0.83 by 8,000. Let's see how it does it. 8,000.json. Okay, that's hilarious. Watch this. <laughs> how big are those JSON files? Um, it's however many weights I put in my neural network. I don't know. Let's see. Uh, okay, policy 9,500. Uh, let's word wrap it. That's it. So I used a really small neural network in this case. The nice thing with using a small one is there's not a lot of weights to mess with. It evolves really quickly. But uh, yeah, this is a pretty tiny model considering it's controlling such a sophisticated robot. Anyway, we've left the all plausibility at this point, but hey, it's getting higher. So see how high it is now. 84, still stuck around 10,500. Let's look at that one, and then we'll be done with that. Um, 10,500.json, where'd it go? You just viewed the policy. You k'd it instead of... Oh, I just running. viewed it. Thank you. That's what it was. Too many things going on here. Okay, jumper policy 10,500. That actually doesn't look much different. But here's what it did. What it did. So it gets on its toes and then flings its body and lands on its head. Maybe we've discovered the new way that high jumpers could actually get better. I don't think so, but there we go. Okay, so imagine that you had a... Uh, imagine you have some kind of a surface where vertical position represents how stupid it is. And so we want to get farther down. And maybe your population is distributed like uh, these big circles. There, 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 and there. We'll say he's right down there. So this is what's called a local optimum. This is the global optimum. The local optimum is oh, I'm on the wrong side. Local optimum is uh, not the best, but it's the best around here, right? Global optimum is the best place you could possibly get to. And in this case, what's the horizontal axis re represent? Genome. It's some encoding of your chromosome or your genome or whatever values you're trying to evolve, right? Now, I only have one dimension to work with here, but what if we keep this guy alive because he's the best one we've ever seen? What will happen? We'll never get to the actual maximum. Yeah, so well, by never, we might. Longer. It might be that we just get the lucky mutation that causes one of these guys to be way over there. And if we do, then he'll become the new best one, and then we'll evolve from there. And that'll actually be a really, really good thing for the algorithm. But. The odds of getting that lucky are pretty slim. I mean, what, what are the odds that the right cosmic rays are going to strike a worm and its child is going to be human? <laughs> it just doesn't happen, right? It, if, if your space is complicated enough, it's going to take many generations to get better. So, assuming it takes a lot of generations to find the global optimum, 
You see why we don't necessarily want to keep the best guy, the best one round we found? Because as long as it's there, every time we have babies, we're going to have one that's mixed with this guy, right? And every time we do a mutation, we'll drift away from it, but then they'll keep dying because he'll keep winning the tournaments. And so what kind of happens is because this member of the population is in a good spot, it's like those little invisible rubber bands pulling everything toward it. Can you kind of see that? I mean, it's not very explicit. Depending on how much you mutate and how long it takes and how strong your tournaments are, he might not kill everybody off. But you can only get so far away from the best guy before he's just going to win all the tournaments. And so you, you can't get too far from the best one. Um, consequently, sometimes it's actually best to let him die. And when he does, what ends up happening is you probably find it again. And then you get there again. But if they can die again, maybe eventually you stumble across this and it starts rolling down here and maybe you rediscover this local optimum. But this guy hasn't died off yet. Maybe he does get killed off, but maybe after he does, this one evolves a little bit more and pretty soon you roll down here and this one becomes the best. And now the algorithm is going to start exploring around this area. Once that happens, these ones over here, even in this local optimum, are much more likely to die, right? Because as soon as a tournament occurs, they're going to lose. And when you lose tournaments, you probably die. Um, so what does, this tell, what does this tell us about how to use a genetic algorithm effectively? Well, one is you want everybody to have a chance of death, even the best member of the population, probably. So when you do the tournaments, you probably don't just want to kill the bottom half. You probably want to do a tournament and then probabilistically kill everybody, but lower probability of killing the best ones and better probability of killing the worst ones. And what that does is it lets it kind of explore more. OK. Um, now the question comes up, how strongly should you bias it? Well, that depends on the problem space. So imagine this global optimum is really far away and hard to get to, and this local optimum is really close to your initialization. You're going to have to do a lot of exploration to get to the global optimum, right? So in that case, we need to not bias it too strongly. So we almost want everyone to have almost equal chances of dying, maybe just slightly better chances of living if you win the tournament. Does that make sense? Um, and in that case, it'll just spread out kind of randomly, but very slowly evolve towards better genomes. Um, one could ask, how much pressure do you perceive in on planet Earth? Do, do less fit individuals, are they, how hard is it to survive if you're a suboptimal person? <laughs> That's not going to go very well. I don't want to get into the whole Aryan race or anything wrong like that. Um, but I mean, how? what can I say? How about people with glasses? Do you feel that people with glasses should all be put to death? Probably not, right? I mean, I have pretty bad vision. I just don't wear glasses because I don't like them. So if, if all the bad vision people were put to death, I would go with them. But. Since we can compensate for glasses, nobody gets eaten by dinosaurs anymore. Do you see that there's, it's not that important for us to have great vision? And so these days, a lot of people don't have great vision. Is that disconcerting? Have you ever noticed that uh, humans are just kind of weak compared to, say, the immune system of a bloodhound or a, or, you know, your dogs can eat raw meat and they don't get sick, right? What happens if we eat raw meat? Probably go into the hospital. Well, we're, isn't it interesting that the more intelligent we get, the weaker we get? I don't know. There's something kind of disappointing about that. Um, nevertheless, it has something to do with how you want to use your genetic algorithms, is what I'm trying to get at. Um, somehow I lost my train of thought there. The point I was trying to get across is you want to make sure there's a whole lot of exploration going. Uh, but you don't want the pressure to be so weak that it takes forever to get there. I think I mentioned last time that if your surface is very clean, meaning uh, 
pretty much looks like that. What kind of parameters would be effective for evolving over this type of a space? Pretty mild mutation, not too crazy. Okay. Well, agent. There's a method in it named update. And here's what it does. It calculates uh, 20 values. Value number zero is uh, your x position divided by 600 minus 0.5. Value number one is your y position divided by 600 minus 0.5. Value number two is the arctangent of your position, your y and your x divided by four. What's that doing? This is the polar representation of your location on the screen. Um, this is the distance you are from the origin, so the distance of your ball from the center. You see that? Let's look at this one. This is how fast you're moving in the x direction, how fast you're moving in the y direction, the angular direction in which you're moving, the speed at which you're moving. This is your opponent's position. How fast your opponent is moving, where you are relative to your opponent. Basically, it's just all the data you would ever want. Do you see that? Okay. So we're going to use a neural network to take all the data that you would ever want to know about the game, what's going on, what the current state is, and based on that, we're going to decide what direction to move and how fast to move in that direction. Basically, if you get the right stuff in this box, the ball behaves intelligently. Can you see that? All we need is to get the right stuff in the box. <coughs> well, what this box is, is a neural network. And a neural network is a big, nasty, hairy math equation that has a whole bunch of coefficients, a bunch of parameters. We call them weights. And if we get those weights right, the balls will start to behave intelligently. So your goal in this assignment is to get the weights inside the box to be pretty reasonable. Now, as I've looked, okay, um, let's look at game. This is where it all starts. The game class has a method here named main. Now, main here, you'll see it makes a new neural agent with Bob. Bob is this massive vector of uh, numbers. Right? I think I told you before that I obtained these, these big vector of numbers by implementing a genetic algorithm, and I evolved for 50,000 generations. So if you want to beat mine, you just need to implement a genetic algorithm that's at least as good as my implementation and run it for 50,001 generations, or maybe two until it gets better. And presumably, the vector that emerges from yours is going to be a little bit better than this one, and you'll make a vector and hard code it in here, and then you'll come down here and battle your agent. Instead of Randy, you'll use your name or something like that, and your sumo ball will beat uh, Bob. Okay? Does that make sense? Good enough? You get the high level picture of that? Okay. Well, Right here, I made Randy. Randy is a new double of 291 values. The reason there's 291 is that's the number of weights in this particular neural network. You shouldn't need to mess with it. You don't need to understand neural networks. You don't need to understand where those weights are going. All you need to know is you make an array of 291 double precision floating point values. You pass it to the constructor of neural agent. That will create a neural network that controls your sumo ball and we'll play it in the game. And if you call do battle, it will do battle. And if your numbers stink, Bob will beat you. Okay? So the one, so you do need to know enough to create an agent and do battle. That's easy, just copy that code. And you need to implement a genetic algorithm to evolve these numbers. Okay, 
So when we come to your matrix, we know that N needs to be 291. What should M be? I'm going to say use your own judgment and you pick. What do you think will happen if we say M is uh, 10? You probably won't get that good of results. Probably. However, honestly, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if that works really well. Um, here's why. Let's suppose you say M is equal to 1,000. Can you see that this is going to take 100 times longer on average for each member of the population to change by about the same amount? That is, if your mutation rate randomly picks one each time. Um, in genetic algorithms, if you make the, num the size of the population really big, why did I use M here? They always use N for that. That one's M. <coughs> I'm sorry, I messed up. N is always the size of the population. Anyway, that's irrelevant. If your population is, say, twice as big, it's going to take probably twice as long. Now, that's kind of the way it tends to be, but in reality, that's not totally true because you have to have some amount of population to support each other because you need to be able to explore. So if your population is really big, you're kind of exploring the space of possible uh, of possible genomes, right? Now imagine that you had M insanely big. How many iterations of evolution would it take before you discovered a really, really great genome? A really great chromosome? Maybe only once. Yeah, I'm going to claim maybe zero. Because immediately, someone in your population is just going to get lucky. Because that's a darn big population. So arguably, a really big population is better, except you're only going to be able to do zero iterations of evolutionary optimization before your computer is swamped, because that's a lot of members of the population. Or rather, it'll take that long before everybody has the chance to update even once. So it's going to be slow. Uh, conversely, if you have a very small population, well, now you're sampling the space very, very poorly. But the same 10 are going to get updated over and over and over, and a lot of churn will happen, and maybe they'll find a better, better uh, chromosome. So what's the right answer? I don't know. 10 is about the bottom limit. Don't go less than 10. It won't work. 100 is probably good. 1,000 is getting kind of big. 10,000. This would be reasonable if you were going to let it run for days, and if you have a supercomputer or things like that. This is probably a a pretty typical size population. Once you're getting up to 100,000, frankly, you're wasting your time. You're, you're mutating chromosomes that are never going to evolve. So you're, you're just, unless you have ridiculous amounts of computing time, this is getting too big. OK? So you have some intuition for what parameters to use there? Okay. Now. So how do you implement mutation? You pick a random number, change it. Because these, uh, because our chromosomes are not Gattaca, they're not uh, guanine, adocene, cytosine, whatever the amino acids are, they're actually continuous valued numbers. Now how do you mutate it? Well, I'm going to say, draw a random number from a Gaussian distribution and add it to your number. Okay, so how do you draw a random number from a Gaussian distribution? The java.random class has a nice method called next Gaussian. <laughs> it will return a Gaussian number <laughs> for you. Um, it returns a Gaussian number from a standard Gaussian distribution, which means it has a deviation of 1. Um, that's not necessarily the right deviation. But for now, we'll just say, just draw a number from that, add it to your number, and there, you mutated it. OK? Now, for selecting the most fit chromosomes, you can use the controller rank agents method. 
Okay. I provided a really nice feature for you here. In my controller class, there's one function you need to know about. You don't need to know how it works, but it wouldn't hurt. This is called rank agents. Now, when you what you do in rank agents is you pass in an array list of agents. And what it does is it performs a pairwise competition between every two agents. And then it counts up how many times each one of them wins, and it returns to you this array list, or this array of indexes of the winners. So element zero in this array is the index of the agent that performed the best in all of the tournaments. Element one is the index of the array of the agent that performed the second best in all of the tournaments, and so on. And, and so it just battles against the ones that you pass in. They just battle each other. Yep. So if you pass in 10 agents to this list, then it will perform, let's do an easier number. Let's suppose you pass in three agents to this list. <laughs> agent A will battle against Agent B. Agent A will get, battle against Agent C. Agent B will battle against Agent C. Actually, it does it both ways. So it's going to be three times three, there'll be nine. If there's 10, it'll be 100 battles. It does every battle with each agent playing red and then each agent playing blue and counts up the total number of wins, uh, sorts them, returns it. If you were to actually look at the code, you'll see that's what it does. Here it calls do battle, no GUI. No GUI means don't show it to me, I don't want to see it. Um, we sort the agents by the number of wins, return the list. Okay. Essentially, I've done all the work for you. That's the hard part. The hard part is setting them all up and running these tournaments and seeing which one's the best, so that should be really easy for you. If you want to, you can use do tournament. This actually does a single tournament, so you... Oh no, this does all of them. There's a... What is it? It's do battle. You can call do battle directly yourself if you just want to do a battle between two agents and see which one wins. Okay. So that's what you need to rank the agents. Okay, now what are you going to do after you call controller rank agents? In your code, you've got this uh, array list of chromosomes. You've ranked them. You've figured out which ones are the best, which ones are the worst, then what? Kill the worst. Yeah. So maybe pick the worst 10% and say goodbye. <laughs> Delete them or zero them out or just leave them there and then tell the others to have babies and stomp the babies over their slots, however you want to do it. But somehow the worst ones are going to die, the best ones are going to live. Okay. Then. For replenishing the population, please implement crossover. Okay, let me talk about what crossover is. Okay. Here comes the mom. The mom has G A G A C A C A C and the dad. Is T A C C A G D A G D C C A. Okay. Mom and the dad have sex. Then the baby is basically going to get some portion of the mom's chromosomes plus some portion of the dad's chromosomes. I have now done crossover. Any questions? Should it always be 50-50? Ah, that's a good question. So, um, how to implement crossover? Essentially, you're going to use part of one and part of another and produce the result, and as long as you do that, you could call that crossover. So the crossover is a pretty vague system. Obviously, what we're doing here is we're being inspired by the genetic recombination that occurs in sexual reproduction. 
So the idea is you have 46 chromosomes, you get 23 from the one parent, 23 from the other parent, and those, the mixture of those 23 chromosomes produces all kinds of combinations, and so they all have uh, siblings. Now, the, the most common type of crossover implemented in genetic algorithms is called single point crossover. The way it works is you pick a random point, so pick a random number between one and the, the end, the end of the, the number of uh, elements in the chromosome, and wherever that point is, we call this the crossover point. So we take all of the father before that point and all of the mother after that point, or vice versa, and that makes the child. So the idea of single point crossover is there's a single point where you cross over, and then you've done it. So we're um, doing this to um, doubles? Or yeah. Now, in, in this particular case, you've got this array of 241 double precision floating point values. So basically, pick a random number from 0 to 240, and whatever number you pick, all the ones before that come from one parent, all the number after that come from another parent. This is single point crossover. Guess what other kinds of crossover there are? There's one called double point crossover, where you pick two points, and then you go to the point, and then you switch to the other parent, and then you switch back to this parent. And then some genius came up with triple point crossover. Um, um, obviously, we can go to the extreme. Here's the extreme. At every single element, we flip a coin. And if it's heads, we pick from the mom. If it's tails, we pick from the dad. So somewhere between single point crossover and n point crossover is probably one that works pretty well. If you want, you could roll dice to figure out what number of crossover points to use, and then you could implement that number of crossover points. And then you've got all kinds of weird genetic recombination things going on. And what's fun about genetic algorithms is the weirder you get, the more likely it is that you're going to explore the space well and eventually you're probably going to find something that's good. Does that make sense? So it doesn't have to be biologically inspired. It's actually OK to go weird, go a little beyond whatever biology is doing, and come up with your own operations. That tends to actually improve genetic algorithms rather than harm them, as long as you have the major components of somehow promote diversity, somehow kill off the less fit ones. Yeah? I'm guessing it's just throwing this Averaging them and then taking that probably wouldn't be good um, to freezing them. That's another way to do recombination. Um, if you were to average them, however, imagine that you were always averaging them. Do you see how the population would kind of shrink to the same point? If you take a bunch of points and you keep averaging, you're always going to be pulled inward. There's this sort of inward pulling force. So let's talk about that. Let's suppose I plot these chromosomes. So I've plotted some chromosomes. Now, because this is a two-dimensional whiteboard, you can only assume there are two uh, numbers in this chromosome. They're very short chromosomes for the moment. But I pick two parents at random. There we go. I'm going to average them. Bing, there's the child. That's what will happen if you do that. What will happen if you do a uh, crossover? Do you see that interpolation gets you here, crossover kind of gets you there, or it gets you there, right? Because you're taking one of the values from one parent and one of the values from the other parent. It kind of reaches the corners of whatever the parents do. Except we're really in hyperdimensional space, so there's a lot more corners in it. it sort of does this type of a thing. Which operation makes more sense? They both make sense in different situations. Interestingly, the crossover seems to be very, very effective. Interpolation seems to not really add very much. So in this assignment, I'm asking you to implement some type of crossover, not interpolation. However, I'm not saying don't do interpolation. If you want to add that as a possible operation too, that's better than just doing crossover. The, the more things you do, the cooler your algorithm is, genetic algorithms. Yeah. So why is cross or how is crossover different than just randomly picking a point? Um, well, 
if you have these two parents, there's no way the child will be out here because no parent has a value in this dimension that's way out there. Um, so it definitely, it, it, crossover definitely won't do that. Do you agree? Now, why is crossover better than doing that? Because we're already assuming the parents have traits that we want. Yeah, so here's the intuition. We assume some amount of evolution has already occurred. So the population has kind of drifted towards goodness. And if that has happened, then crossover is likely to produce a child that's also basically not retarded. Um, whereas if you pick at random chromosomes, chances are you're not going to get a good child. Now, if, if you're early in the evolutionary process, crossover is going to do just as badly as picking random. So random actually works really well early on, but the more evolved your population gets, the less useful random seems to be. Yeah. So at the beginning, our population is purely random? Yes, probably. Okay. Um, I put probably in there because, in fact, it works if your population is initially random. It works if your population is initially somehow intelligent. And if, if your initial population is intelligent, you might have saved yourself a bunch of uh, effort. So on that note, How since, you an initially intelligent population? Take Bob <laughs> since your entire goal <laughs> is to beat Bob, do you think it might be a good idea to have Bob be in your population to begin with? Yes, <laughs> son of Bob. Right. If Bob has enough children, you're just going to beat him. Now, partly that makes the assignment kind of stupid because if it only takes you a few generations to find one better than Bob, what was the point? So I'm going to say, I'm going to stick with the instructions say you just have to beat Bob. So if you beat Bob, you get full credit. But just for the sake of learning a little bit, see if you can beat Bob without including Bob. Just because you're awesome. <laughs> and if you don't, I'm not going to even look, but it, it would be cooler not to even include Bob in the population, just because then you can, you can prove that you coded yours up at least as well as I coded mine up. What if about 7% of our random population beats Bob anyway, like our initial population? If that happens, I'll be darn surprised. <laughs> oh, it did. It, yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> Well, maybe it's a stupid assignment, but we're going to pretend it's awesome anyway and move <laughs> forward. Um, so you're saying you pick random numbers and they beat Bob. Yeah, I just used the uh, next Gaussian and generated like 300 and about 7%. Yeah. Dang. Um, <laughs> a few more hundred thousand. I kind of figured Bob would do pretty well because I evolved him for a long time. And then as a human, I battled against him, and I had a hard time beating him. And I even battled Bob against Bob, and he survived for a while. So I'm really surprised that random numbers beat Bob. That's too bad. <laughs> OK, I guess this is one of those assignments where the wimpy people that aren't interested in learning are just going to not get a darn thing out of it. I feel bad about that. I just don't know how to enforce it any better. So we're going to still do it. And you're still going to code up a full genetic algorithm, even knowing you could probably just draw random numbers and beat him pretty efficiently. Darn, I wish I didn't know that. And I wish you didn't know that. <laughs> um, yeah, well, that's what we're going to do. Let me show you what I did to the last last year's class. I had them do this problem. So do you remember this problem where we're searching for the optimal path to get from here to there? We used a genetic algorithm to find to evolve a path. And each chrome each chromosome in the path represented a direction and was it a step size? Yeah, I think we had a direction and a step size. And so you can imagine a path being a sequence of chromosomes, right? And so we evolved until the path got from here down to there. And we generated some really interesting animations of these paths initially starting out dumb and so eventually evolving until they pointed down there and then evolving until they kind of followed the 
the nicer paths and things like that. It's a good example because it uh, is easy to visualize on two-dimensional plane. It's a bad example because genetic algorithms stink in two dimensions. They're really well designed for big high dimensional problems. And that's why I improved them by going to assignment four, which I thought there'd be no way to see <coughs> just by picking random numbers. Okay. <clears throat> So, I forgot where I was. We did crossover. Oh, I wanted to finish on crossover. Um, okay. One other operation you can do. Suppose you did a weighted interpolation. Suppose you pick a random weight, you give 80% of the weight to the mother and 20% of the weight to the father. Where's the child going to end up? Right there, right? Um, well, if you pick a random weight, it'll be somewhere, anywhere along here. What if you pick an, a weighting that instead of between 0 and 1, you pick a weighting between, say, 0 and 2, or 0 and 3? See what'll happen? That'll basically make the child go like this. The child will be so much like its mother that it's like its mother minus some of the father. <laughs> um, the nice thing about this is whereas interpolation has the tendency to pull the points together over time, if you pick a random value between 0 and 2, it's just as likely to throw the child out there as it is to uh, pull the child in. And so this is extrapolation, whereas this is interpolation. And if you're going to do interpolation, you might as well just do extrapolation by randomly picking your weights. And that makes a really nice operation for genetic algorithms. So this is not one you actually need to code up. You do have to do crossover for this assignment. Um, but if you want to do crossover and interpolation and extrapolation, then you've got a really nice um, way of promoting diversity in your population while replenishing the uh, missing members of your population. By the way, if you want to add as a one possible operation, start a new random member in your population, apparently that's going to work really well in this assignment. And uh, it's not a bad thing to do in general. Suppose you add an operation like this. Is there any chance that could just totally screw up your genetic algorithm? Well, there's always a chance, but it's a slim chance because presumably when we do a tournament, the new guy is just going to always die. Unless that new guy happens to be brilliantly effective at staying alive, in which case, well, hey, it's really good. And then it's going to survive and have offspring, and pretty soon the population will kind of migrate over to the really good spot. Does that make sense? So it's all about wherever the population is surviving, that's where they're going to keep surviving. Where they're dying, that's where they're going to die off. So eventually the population is going to go where it's effective. Okay. Now. Okay, you may use a fixed size population. Ah, some other metaparameters will also be required, such as the mutation rate and the average deviation for, of each mutation. Okay. How familiar are you guys with the Gaussian distribution? Not at all? Okay. Here's a picture of the norm of the probability density function of the normal distribution. Um, me. The normal distribution is often called the bell curve because it looks like a bell. Anybody think that looks like a bell? I don't think it looks like a bell, but it's called a bell curve. The idea is it's most likely you'll draw a value around here, kind of unlikely you'll draw a value here, just about impossible you'll draw a value out here. But by just about I mean not impossible, just almost impossible. So 
Gaussian values usually fall around here somewhere. Um, nice thing about the Gaussian is it's just as likely to be positive as it is negative. So if you add a random Gaussian value to your number, it's not clear which way you're perturbing it. You might be perturbing it up, you might be perturbing it down. Okay? Some other interesting things about the Gaussian distribution. One of them is, imagine that you wanted to pick a random number. Suppose you pick a random number between 0 and 1, and you plot it inside this box. That's not the way to put it. Suppose you pick two random numbers between 0 and 1, and you plot them on the screen. What's it going to look like? It will fill up a box, right? OK. Suppose you pick two random Gaussian, two random values from a Gaussian distribution, and you plot them. What will it look like? It'll be not lines, these are points. There'll be a few all over the place, but they'll be very well centered. Um, the interesting thing about this is this point cloud will be perfectly round, not squarish. The reason that's interesting is if you pick two values from a Gaussian distribution, they're just as likely to point in any angular direction as any other. Whereas, <coughs> If you pick from this uh, uniform distribution, even if you center it at zero, do you see that you're not as likely to point in an axis aligned direction as you are to point towards one of the corners? Because there's more points in here that are in the corner area than there are that are in the side area, because these corners are farther away than the side. So a lot of people think that drawing from the uniform distribution is being totally random. It's actually not. It's biasing you. You're pushing your population in a biased direction. Whereas if you draw from the Gaussian distribution, you're just as likely to push your population this way as that way. And so you're not really biasing it. You're not saying to your population, try to go over that way. You're just letting it wander freely. So the most unbiased, the most free way to perturb your values in your population is with the Gaussian distribution. Um, that's just a gee whiz thing that I think is kind of interesting. That's why we use Gaussian instead of uniform. Make sense? Okay. Um, if you're ever asked to draw, pick a random point on the surface of a sphere, you can do it by drawing random values from a Gaussian distribution and then normalizing them. And it's perfectly distributed on the surface of a sphere. You can't do that with uniform distribution. Okay. Um, one thing with the Gaussian distribution is you have to specify a deviation, meaning how far is it this one that's really tall, or is it this one that's really wide, right? Um, this red one has a deviation of 1. This blue one has a deviation of 0.5. Nope, 0.2. No, that's squared. Square root of 0.2, whatever that is. What's the square root of 0.2? Yeah, something like that. OK. And this yellow one has a deviation of the square root of 0.5. Nope, that's this one. Square root of 5. OK. My point is, if you have a big deviation, it means the points are really all over the place. If you have a small deviation, they're going to be really close to 0, right? What deviation should you use when you're perturbing your values in a genetic algorithm? It's a darn good question, and I don't know the answer. So let's draw a picture, because that always works. <coughs> Imagine now I don't like that picture. OK, there's a good picture. I like this one. That looks interesting. OK. Um, I'm going to use the horizontal axis to represent all 241 weights. Is that how many there were? 
291. 291. However many weights there are, pretend each position on here represents a different set of weights. I only have one axis to work with, sorry, but as I perturb the weights, I'm either going to make my algorithm better or worse, right? I'm going to use the vertical axis to represent stupidity. So what I really want is to get down into this cavern, because this cavern is this cavern of smartness. Here's my members of the population. I initialize them all randomly. Nobody's down in the cavern of smartness. So here we go. These two get together and have a baby. Now they're here. Baby's even dumber than both parents. That's too bad. Um, suddenly, a tournament occurs. Everybody gets in a fight. Um, the worst ones are this one. That one dies. This one dies. And the baby dies, which is really sad. The mother and father cry. The music plays. Um, eventually, more randomness happens, and uh, These two get together and have a baby. Ooh, that was fortunate. Now this happens. Baby's down starting to get into the uh, valley of smartness. You can kind of see how this uh, genetic recombination helps explore the space really quickly, right? OK. Can't remember when I started talking about that. I wanted to talk about mutation. Now I'm talking about mutation. I'm going to mutate this one. Made it worse. Mutate it again. Yay, made it better. Mutate it, made it worse. Mutate it, yay, made it better. Mutate it some more. Made it better. Mutate it some more. Made it lots better. Mutate it a little bit. Made it way worse. OK. Um, but the question is, how much do you mutate it by? Right? Well, that depends on the shape of this surface. If the surface is nicely smooth, then kind of doesn't matter. You're just going to roll downhill. In this case, if you mutate it by too much, you see you're just going to jump around. You're never going to get lucky and fall down in here, right? I mean, you might. You never know. You might get lucky and fall down in there, but it's unlikely to happen if the space is really big. Now, this looks hard in one-dimensional space. Imagine now it's 249-dimensional space. This valley could be this, you know, pin size divot in this massive space, because you can go in all these different directions. You see how it gets increasingly difficult with dimensionality to get into that hole? So what do you do about that? Um, well, if your mutation rate's kind of small, everybody's jiggling around and then people are dying, they're going to kind of drift downhill and eventually get down in here. If your step size is too big, you'll overshoot it. But if your step size is too small, it might be that it takes all of eternity to get down in there, right? Can you see that both cases are bad? If your deviation is too close to zero, you'll never get there. If it's close to infinity, you'll never get there. <coughs> so you have to know the shape of the terrain. The problem is you never know the shape of the terrain. If you did, you wouldn't be using a genetic algorithm. The whole point of a genetic algorithm is this is what you use when nothing else works. And for some reason, genetic algorithms just kind of work, in all cases, badly. Um, so what can we do? Well, here's a funny idea. Suppose that you've got this uh, chromosome. And what do these numbers represent? Well, in this case, they're the weights of a neural network. But the thing is, is they could be anything. Anything you want to evolve, you can evolve with a genetic algorithm. That's why genetic algorithms are cool, is they just work with whatever problem you've got. You just throw it in and they work. So what if we use one of these elements to encode the deviation of the Gaussian distribution? You follow me? Essentially, what we're saying is, we're going to encode the weights of the neural network and some of the metaparameters used by evolution itself. Does that happen in the real world? Do humans contain in their DNA markers that influence how susceptible they are to mutations or to uh, 
factors that could influence their own genetic recombination and things like that. Um, I claim that, yeah, there are some people that are more virile than others. There are some people that are more susceptible to diseases than others. There's some people that are actually robust to uh, mutations based on radiation and all kinds of things. Um, but whether or not it's biologically inspired, we're going to stick the deviation in the chromosome itself, and then what will tend to happen? Well, the, uh, the members of the population that have the deviation about right will be the ones that will find their way down here. And the ones that don't find their way down here, they've probably got their deviation wrong, so it's OK if they die. And so over time, what happens is the, good, the fit members of the population also have the parameters that are most fit for evolution itself. So essentially, we're going to use evolution to solve the problem of the metaparameters that dictate what causes evolution. Isn't that funky? OK. Um, yeah. So with this, since there's so many, like 200 and something parameters on it, I don't know the specifics of like how you've done this game, but would it ever be the case that Say for like, whichever of our iterated population is the best. Uh -huh. For him, if he's like almost there to be, to improve in some way, like could it ever possibly require like two changes to happen together to uh -huh. make him better? Whereas if you just change one, he's bad. If you change the other, he's bad. Yeah. If you do two together, he's great. In fact, absolutely. That is a thing that can happen and often does. So I guess I'm going to do what professors are supposed to do and throw this back at you. How might one solve that? Uh, the nice one is population. So over several iterations, those two changes have been explored. Yeah. So um, you, there's a lot of ways to do that. Here's the main, well, one way to do it is you could have with some probability not just one mutation occur, but two mutations occur. Now, if you do it that way, then it's going to take longer before you happen to get the two right mutations, right? Um, but there's one solution. Another solution is, what if your tournaments aren't the end, the last word on who lives and who dies? So what usually happens in genetic algorithms is when you select the most fit chromosomes to survive, you don't just run a tournament and kill the bad ones. You run a tournament, and then you roll dice to see what happens. So maybe with 90% probability, the winner survives. With 80% probability, second place survives. And with 90% probability, the worst guy dies. But there's some possibility that you can actually live even though you're a bad chromosome. And the idea then being, maybe in future generations, the really bad member of the population will find its way into one of these uh, really obscure, obscure valleys. Um, for example, this member of the population is looking pretty bad, right? Well, actually, it's one of the best. But you could imagine being right next to the big dip and yet still not looking like one of the best members of the population. But if we allow the bad ones to live, sometimes they explore places that we didn't know were awesome, and they turn out to be awesome. OK? Now, here's a question. Would genetic algorithms work if the uh, surface area looked like this? So let's suppose the fitness is just so chaotic that uh, there's no spatial locality of, meaning if you're here, you're no closer to being the best point than you are if you're anywhere else. This is kind of the maze running scenario, right? Would a genetic algorithm work in this case? The part of it that would work well is a really big population. So if you have a humongous population, it might get lucky. But the process of evolving is pretty much worthless. There's no mutation that's necessarily going to make progress, no genetic recombination that's going to make progress. The only thing that's going to help with this type of thing is a massive population. Conversely, 
what if the topology looked like this? What kind of uh, parameters, metaparameters, would be good for this? Um, average the parents together. Yeah, that would be well. I'm going to say that a big population is just going to drag you down in this case, because a big population means everybody's moving at a slower rate. And what we really want is, imagine we only have one member of the population, maybe two, and we just perturb it a little bit. Up, down, up, down, up, down, and we keep keeping the better one. It's basically going to roll down into the optimal spot, and we're going to prevail, right? So when you have a nearly convex uh, error surface, you don't want a big population. You want evolution. When you have a very chaotic error surface, you want a big population, and the evolution is not going to help you very much because it doesn't really occur. Well, where are you going to store the size of your population and the robustness of the population against mutations and the number of mutations and how fast they occur and all these things. Um, a whole bunch of numbers are going to appear in your code and you're going to realize, oh, I need a number here. Two things you can do. You can hard code it. But what I want you to do is stick those numbers in the genomes themselves and let them evolve because that's cooler. Okay. Now, sometimes the numbers will become stupid. Like, you can't have a population of negative four. Right? <laughs> So you'll have to have a little code in there to check it, and normalize it, and make sure it's intelligent. But otherwise, that should work just fine. Um, let's see, I'm hearing a lot of zippers. Am I out of time? Yeah. Why don't we start at two thirty? We start at two. Okay, I have one minute. In my last minute, let's talk about our scheduling. Okay, I've talked you through this. There's a couple more things to say about genetic algorithms, but I think you get it. I think you can code it up. I don't think this is a hard assignment. Do you need the weekend? Those are be nice. Okay, you got it. I'll give you the weekend. Um, I will make it do Monday. Yeah. Okay, Monday it is. Thanks for coming. Thank you.